Hello everybody, my name is Sir Friedrich of Wickerbill. Okay, my name is not Sir Friedrich of Wickerbill. Actually, I've changed my name to protect myself from all you crazed fans out there. Anywho, today I will be talking to you about statistics. Dun dun dun. More so, basic statistics. Dun dun dun. Okay, no more dun dun. So first of all, don't freak out. Um, dude, dude, yeah, are you good? Huh, can you smile? Okay, now chill out, and it'll all be okay. Okay? Okay. So breathe, and just think, I'm strong enough, I'm smart enough, and gosh darn it, people like me. If you do that, I promise we'll get through this. After all, I'm really not that smart. So, basic concepts are what I do best. Dude, go away. Okay. So, what the heck is this word I speak of? Statistics. Simply put, it is collecting and analyzing numbers so we can make assumptions about other numbers. Another scary word you may hear is inferential statistics. Doesn't that just send chills down your spine? However, sounds much scarier than it is. If we break it down, we have inferential, or to infer, or to make assumptions about something using reason. And we've already said that statistics is all about assumptions about numbers. So inferential statistics is about using numbers to make assumptions about other numbers. Or you could say we're making inferences about other numbers. So let's get started with a symbol and concept that you may or may not recognize called summation. When you see the summation symbol, all it is saying is, hey you. No, not you. Go away. It's saying, hey you, we need to add these up. So if you see a summation sign before, say, uh, a set of parentheses, it is signaling you to add up the numbers in parentheses. As such, it may be helpful if you think of the summation symbol as being made up of a lot of plus symbols. This is important for two reasons. One, it reminds you to add the quantities. And two, it will show you where to start adding and where to stop adding. For example, calculate the summation of a series of numbers beginning at one and ending at four. Well, because we know how to count, we know this, this number set is going to include a 1, 2, 3, and 4. As such, 1 plus 2 is going to equal 3. 3 plus 3 is 6. 6 plus 4 is 10. So the summation of 1 to 4 is 10. It can also signal a rule uh, that you will adhere to, such as, in this example, with each number having to be squared. Some of the symbols you'll be more familiar with uh, come in the form of the English alphabet. As such, when you see the letter N, it will represent a population. If it is a capital N, it will be the total population. If this is a lowercase n, it will only be part of the total population. This is called a sample. This is kind of like when you sit down to eat at a restaurant and your like, wife or girlfriend says, can I just try a bite of yours? And the next thing you, you know, she's uh, belching and apologizing. Saying, I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize I was that hungry. So her first bite was a sample of your food. The follow-up inhalation of your entire main course would be the total population. These shapes represent the total population. This is what is left of all the blue uh, triangles and squares and circles in the entire world. Who knew? There are 30 total, which gives us an N of 30. Let's say we don't have time or the resources to study each individual shape. So we decide to take a sample of 10 out of our total of 30. This would be a sample of 10 or an N of 10. We can sample any number we like, and when we pick random shapes out of a total, 
we call it random sampling. This is a very important step in experimental research in order to avoid intentionally or unintentionally biasing the data set. Think of it as if you go looking for trouble, you'll find it. Handpicking data that supports your hypothesis is trouble, and it only yields a fictional tale of what is going on. You want answers. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Okay, I digress. An important term you will hear over and over is model. More aptly, a statistical model. In a general sense, we know that a model is something that we create in order to explain or show something else. When we build a toy model car, it becomes a visual representation of the original car. It should look just like the original, just different. When we watch models on the catwalk, I know we think to ourselves, wow, they look just like me. That may be a bad example, actually. As long as you understand that a model is a visual representation of something else, we'll be golden. We've already said that statistics is collecting and analyzing numbers so we can make assumptions about other numbers. And a model is a visual representation uh, of something else. Thus, a statistical model is a visual representation of assumptions that we make about a set of numbers. So why do we need models? Well, the same reason we need samples of a total population. Common sense tells us that it is impractical and sometimes impossible to record information about every single unit in a data set. Think of the entire world population. Let's say we want to just study the human population. We decide that uh, we need to decide what data we need to collect first. And then we're going to have to find a way to collect it. We could go door to door, or we could email everyone, or we could call them, Facebook them. There's a lot of possibilities. But are they realistic? There are approximately 7 billion people in the world. There are about 350,000 babies born every day. And there are about 150,000 people that die every day. You can only imagine how difficult it would be to stay ahead of that curve. A similar idea is true for analyzing data. Our brains are powerful processors, but we can only handle so much data at a time. Even if a computer processes the data and spits out the results, if it's not in a bite-sized form that we can comprehend, it's pretty much useless. What we do instead is we find a model that is a representative of a bigger picture, and then we fit that data into that model. Measures of central tendency is such a model. It takes a single value and uses it to describe a set of data by identifying a central position of that data. Pretty much, it is there to represent. Yeah, I am gangsta. As indicated by its name, it has a tendency toward finding the center, or it finds the middleness, if you will. We are probably more familiar with its types, those being the mean, the median, and the mode. The one that we will use the most is going to be the mean. The mean of something it was the average of something. It is this uh, typical representation of something. You may see it represented as X bar, or even this crazy little symbol called nu. But why do we need this central measure? Well, because we need something to compare to. Remember, we need to represent. For example, I would like you to describe a Myrna to me. Go. Yeah, yeah go. Yeah, anytime. Okay, so it's difficult. Well, first of all, because you're not even sure what the heck I just said. But nevertheless, you don't even know what a Myrna is. What if I told you a Myrna resembles a human being in body type? Now you will begin to make assumptions about a Myrna based on human being characteristics. You are using humans as a model to make inferences about a Myrna. At the same time, we could find uh, 
we could find a Myrna and find one that seems to be typically representative of all the other Myrnas, when well, we can make this Myrna our model Myrna. So let's drop in my handy dandy little stick figure here. Yeah, he'll be our representation, kind of a depiction of a of a Myrna. What can you tell me about him? Well, you can describe him, sure. He has stick arms and stick legs and very small stick fingers and toes. What is different about him compared to other Myrnas? Aha! There is the key word. Compare. We need something to compare him to. So here is a, a little stick figure Myrna buddy. Now what do you see? Well, for one, the new guy, well, he looks like he may be a little happier than the other. One thing that we can see for sure is that one is taller than the other. Oh, well, look out. Here comes another Myrna. All right. Now we can definitely see that there are height differences. So let's use their height as a basis of comparison for our model. So I'm going to uh, drop them in next to these perfectly already stacked boxes so we can have a unit of measure. And we can see that the first Myrna is about four units high. The second one is about two units high. And the third one is three units high. Oh, and then for our next trick, I will have them perform acrobatics. Hoo, hoo, hoo. Yeah. So now we can visualize their total heights. One of the simplest formulas that, we've, uh, that we learned early on in our, our math studies was how to find the average. So let's take their total heights and, and we'll divide them by the total number of Myrnas. Oh, sadly, and in an unfortunate turn of events, we were forced to dissect our Myrnas, but please know, this was for the sake of science. We can see that we have an average Myrna, and he is about three units high. So the number three Myrna is three units high and happens to represent our model Myrna. Now, this may or may not be the case uh, whenever you're using numbers. They don't always come out to a perfect uh, rounded unit, but uh, this one did, so we're going to run with it. I kind of feel like there's a joke here with the stick figure models. Hmm. Right, moving on. It's fun to work with blocks like this because we can stack them any way we want in order to visualize or make comparisons. Here we have them laid on their sides. And if you visualize them as Myrnas, they're five Myrnas stacked on top of each other for who knows what reason. Or we could stand them up, or we could lay them down uh, head to toe, kind of like a uh, number line form. Um, let's get a little, uh, little background on our Myrna buddies. First off, Myrna it is a mythical netherworld full of strange and overly simplified creatures. We began studying Myrnas and found out that, well, there are only five left in existence. An unusual fact about Myrnas is that their heights range from about one to 16 units high. This all really depends on their environment they're reared in. Also, since there are so few of them, instead of sampling the Myrnas, you know what, we just shot the moon and said, I'm going to study all five of them. Kind of crazy that way, I know. But what we found, the Myrnas had an average height of 1, 3, 4, 11, and 16 units. As you can see, with our block representations to the left, <laughs> the Myrnas laid out in Myrna centerful fashion, we can represent their total heights on a number line. Actually, let's add some color to this blase black and white piece of work. This may be a little easier to see how our five uh, heights lay down and total up to 35. Take the average of our total heights, which equals 7, and see how it distributes among our five individual heights. This is uh, 
pretty much like our previously dissected little dudes, but this way is a little bit less graphic. Again, we know that the mean or average is the typical representation of the group, and we can compare these values to the average. Here we have um, our blocks laid out on top of each other so we can compare each, each one to the mean. Uh, we have the, the lower one is our 16 unit block. Then we have our 11, our 4, 3, and our 1. We learn that a measure of central tendency is simply a measure of middleness. But does it show us anything about the width or spread of the other numbers? No, it only shows us the center value. What we want to know is how do they, how do the numbers relate to the central major? How do they relate to the mean, the X bar, the average, the middle number? Well, this, com uh, this concept is known as variation. In general, it shows us how much a number varies from another number. Or in this case, how much does each number vary from the mean? So let's figure out how far each height varies from the mean. We can look at it uh, this way, and we can see uh, basically our mean here, or and from our mean, we can count how many units away each, uh, each number is. So the 11 is 1, 2, 3, 4. So we got the 11's 4 away. Say the 3 is 1, 2, 3, 4. It's a 4 away. Um, the 16 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 16 is 9 away. You get the idea. The number of units each height varies from the mean is known as a measurement of variation called deviation. If you notice, some of our numbers show up on the low side of the mean and others on the high side. Well, that is because the mean splits our total 50-50. But look, if we add up both sides, they equal zero. Likewise, if we total up the average, it too will equal zero. Why is this? Because it is how we are manipulating our numbers. Anytime you divide something in half, half will fall on one side of the average, and then half will fall on the other side of the average. Or you could say the, uh, the average is larger than half of it, and then it's going to be smaller than half of it. When you take the average away from the smaller half, you're going to have a negative number. When you take the average away from the larger half, you're going to have a positive number. Just like our stick figures, there's a negative difference in heights um, from our little guys. You can see that X amount on the left side are shorter than the amount on the right side. If we drop our little average guy in here, half of them are going to be shorter half of them are going to be taller. One way to resolve this is to use absolute value of each height minus the mean of the height. You would take the absolute value and then we would get a positive value and then we could add them. To find the mean we would divide the number of variables and this would give us the average deviation. Another method to use is the sum of squares. You guessed it, sum of squares is exactly what it sounds like. You minus the mean from each value, square the total, and then you add up the total squared values. Next we divide the number of variables, which gives us our variance, and then finally we'll take the square root of our total and we'll get what's called a standard deviation. So recapping. We are summing up the squares of the individual heights minus the mean height. And then we take the total, which is the variance, and we find the square root, 
which yields the standard deviation. As we can see, there is a slight difference between the uh, absolute and the sum of squares. And while the average deviation of the absolute value method, while it may work well enough for smaller data sets, the sum of squares is better when you're working with larger data sets and it tends to be a little more exact. Okay, one final recap. Remember, we had five MIRNAs, thus we had an N of five, and their respective heights were one, three, four, eleven, and sixteen. We found their average height, and then we used that average to find the deviation of each individual height. So we took each individual and minus the average. We use the sum of squares in order to convert them to positive numbers so we could sum them up without getting a zero. And then we divided our sum uh, by the number of MIRNAs that we have, which gave us our variance. And then we took the square root of the variance to find the standard deviation of the number set. And if you notice, this kind of creates a loop by taking the standard deviation and you square it, you'll get the variance. You take the variance, you square root it, you get the standard deviation. You take the standard deviation, you square it, you get the variance. You take the variance, you get the point. Okay, that's a wrap on this segment of our learning. I'm going to go ahead and start working on the next video portion and we're going to move into, move into normal distribution, working our way into z-scores.